Hello. We are returning to our readings from the book What is Man? Adam, Alien or Ape? Now we began in the last session to consider the details of the human genome uh, especially in comparison with the genome of the apes and uh, in particular of chimpanzees. And we saw that the common claim that there was a 98% correspondence between the human and chimp genomes is very far from the truth and that when we look at the detail of the situation we find that the true correspondence could be as low as 70 percent uh, or 80 percent perhaps is a more common accepted level but nevertheless you know, we're looking at some very big differences between human and chimpanzee genome. However, in this session, we're going to look even more deeply at this whole question of how the genome of a species manifests itself in terms of the appearance and actions and character of the species in question. In other words, we're looking at the way in which the phenotype, the appearance, structure and behavior of uh, a species is controlled and governed by the genome of the species. And there are some very interesting facts that we're going to look at uh, to demonstrate that the genome has to be expressed and the way that genome is expressed differs profoundly between chimps and humans uh, indeed between humans and any other species so we're reading on from the book and we're looking at the subject of epigenetics or as a fun subtitle the icing on the cake a third issue stems from the fact that large phenotypic that is visible differences between species can be produced by processes that involve no change at all in their genomes. I'm sure you will agree that a caterpillar and a butterfly are two very different things. Anyone unfamiliar with their life cycle would immediately conclude that they are two completely different species, having entirely different appearances, lifestyles, appendages, means of locomotion, diets, and so on. Yet when the genome of a caterpillar and its corresponding butterfly are compared, they turn out to be identical. Obviously, DNA differences cannot be the whole story when comparing organisms with different appearances. So what is going on? The answer is epigenetic processes in which living cells control the way their genes are used or expressed. Potentially this offers a further reason why comparing chimp and human genes does not prove common descent. So how do epigenetics work? Genes occupy less than 2% of the total human genome. 
So most of our DNA is called non-coding and was once considered to be junk DNA. However, the study ENCODE, which we considered last time, uh, has shown that perhaps as much as 80% of the human genome is transcribed, that is copied, into RNA, ribonucleic acid, on a regular basis, suggesting that most so-called non-coding regions of the genome are actually used for some purpose. At present, no function has been identified for much of this material, but since useless transcription wastes precious energy, it shouldn't happen. It should have been eliminated by natural selection, according to the theory of evolution. This strongly suggests that all such transcription of DNA into RNA, RNA, by the way, is the molecule that takes instructions from the DNA and uses them elsewhere in the cell to produce proteins of various kinds. Since this transcription of DNA into RNA does have a function, even though at present we may not know what it is. What we do know, however, is that a lot of non-coding RNAs contribute to the epigenetic processes that regulate the way in which genes are expressed or employed, for example, by switching genes on or off as required by the cell. Epi, E-P-I, is the Greek word for upon or on, and epigenetic processes are those that affect or regulate the way genes are expressed without altering the genes themselves. Let's illustrate this in a simple way. Suppose you are making a Christmas cake. You first bake the cake itself, but it's not yet a Christmas cake. You still need to cover the cake with marzipan, almond paste, sugar icing and decorations. Adding these extras doesn't change the original cake. The layers of icing are superimposed on the basic cake without altering it in any way and could therefore be called epi-cake layers. What they do achieve, however, is to transform the appearance and taste of the cake. They change the way the cake is expressed, put that in inverted commas. And just as there may be several layers of icing and decorations superimposed on a cake, so there are also several layers of epigenetic control affecting the way genes are expressed in a living organism without altering those genes in any way. This means that two organisms with closely similar genes may exhibit large differences in development, appearance and behaviour as different epigenetic effects come into play. The implications of this are still being actively researched, but already some experts, both evolutionists and non-evolutionists, claim that epigenetic effects play a far greater role in biology than do random mutations in the genes themselves. 
uh, for example, as long ago as 1975, King and Wilson wrote, quote, We suggest that evolutionary changes in anatomy and way of life are more often based on changes in the mechanisms controlling the expression of genes than on sequence changes, that is, mutations in proteins. We therefore propose that regulatory mutations account for the major biological differences between humans and chimpanzees. Again, Danish researchers reported in 2013 that cloned pigs, which have identical genomes, vary just as much as naturally propagated pigs due to epigenetic factors. While in 2016, Oxford University scientists, quotes, found that different levels of nitrogen in a parasite's diet contributed to changes in its DNA. The fact that to adjust for external factors, the cell as a system can change the way its DNA is used, throws entirely new light on the nature and function of genes. It has been suggested that an organism's genome is more like a read stroke write CD compact disc than an unchanging library of genetic information. This means that anyone trying to explain why humans and chimps are so different could be wasting their time simply by comparing genes. Could the differences be largely due to epigenetic factors? Could chimpanzee-like ancestors be the caterpillars that turned into human butterflies? Probably not. While epigenetic processes warn us that comparing the genes of two species won't necessarily compare and explain the differences between them, these processes themselves create major problems for macroevolutionary theory. Remember that the theory of common descent demands that enormous amounts of new genetic information must have been created in the proposed evolutionary journey from microbes to man. Traditional neo-Darwinism claims that this came about by trial and error, as random mutations in the DNA of lowly organisms produced accidental improvements in their viability, leading to a superior version of that organism. These improvements, claims the theory, then became fixed in populations of the creature by natural selection. By contrast, while epigenetic effects can influence and sometimes improve the way information is extracted from a genome, they are incapable of creating information that is not already present. Why not? Because, by definition, epigenetic processes do not change the DNA's information storehouse, only the way that information is used. Subheading Alternative Splicing there are many layers of epigenetic processes, but one is of special significance to this discussion, namely something called alternative splicing. Picture it this way. Suppose the top of your Christmas cake is populated by numerous small figurines of snowmen and polar bears arranged randomly 
around the circumference of the cake. And suppose you have an aversion to polar bears, but you like snowmen, and you want to choose only segments of the cake that feature your favourite figurine. You can easily do this by selectively slicing the cake, leaving behind the unwanted parts. You could then, if you chose, join all your snowman slices together on your plate, forming a snowman segment to enjoy at your leisure. Something rather like this happens in living cells after a gene is copied on to the RNA molecule that will carry that gene's information to other parts of the cell. In higher life forms, the RNA is edited by removing unwanted segments of the raw transcript and splicing together the remaining segments. The spliced product is then used to make a particular protein elsewhere in the cell. The segments cut out and discarded are called introns, think polar bears, and those retained and joined together are called exons, think snowmen. The original genetic information is thus carefully edited, and only when the editing process is complete is the RNA molecule now a mature messenger RNA is unleashed to do its work. Uh, but here comes the bombshell. The same stretch of raw transcribed RNA containing all the information from the gene can be edited in different ways by alternative splicing to produce a variety of different proteins from the same DNA gene. In the Christmas cake analogy, instead of choosing just snowmen, you could select 75% snowmen slices and 25% polar bear slices, or vice versa. But even this is an oversimplification. You could, for example, cut your slice through a snowman, keeping some of it on your slice, but leaving the rest of it behind. The possibilities are therefore endless. Where does that leave us? The United States National Cancer Institute explains, quotes, our genes can encode more than one protein, even up to 1,000. The human genome contains about 21,000 protein encoding genes, but the total number of proteins in human cells is estimated to be between 250,000 to 1 million. On average, then, according to this quotation, a single gene can code for 10 to 50 different proteins through the mechanism of alternative splicing. But who or what wields the cake knife? What decides which slices to use and which to reject? The cutting and splicing is carried out by large molecular machines called spliceosomes. Think cake knife. But it remains a matter of speculation as to what instructs these machines produce one messenger RNA and thus one protein rather than another. 
even when the mechanism involved is finally worked out, as surely it will be, it will only demonstrate that alternative splicing is a masterpiece of editorial art rather than an accident of nature. Subheading. Can epigenetic effects be inherited? Whether or not epigenetic effects can contribute to permanent differences between genomes and thus to the creation of new species it turns on a further question. Can epigenetic changes in parents be inherited by their offspring? Most evolutionists today would probably argue for a combination of traditional gene mutations that directly affect protein production and mutations in the non-coding DNA responsible for epigenetic control. But epigenetic control mechanisms must function with extreme precision and usually cooperatively to achieve their purpose, such as switching genes on or off or reading the same gene sequences in different ways. It is difficult to see, therefore, how random mutations in the molecular assemblies responsible for epigenetic effects could ever be beneficial and thus selectable in a macroevolutionary sense. It is true that epigenetic changes arising from selective pressures such as changes in climate or food supply, can be inherited. A recent study of lizards, for example, uh, describes adaptation to a new environment that was far too quick to be due to the fixation of random mutations. The abstract of the paper reads as follows. Here we show how lizards have rapidly evolved differences in head morphology, bite strength and digestive tract structure after experimental introduction into a novel environment. But despite the short time scale, about 36 years since this introduction, these changes in morphology and performance parallel those typically documented among species and even families of lizards in both the type and extent of their specialization. Since these changes happen too quickly to be explained by neo-Darwinian mutations and natural selection, they must be due to epigenetic processes. This kind of Adaptive effect is probably quite common and might, for example, help to explain the famous cases of Darwin's finches and peppered moths where a changing environment seems to produce marked phenotypic adaptations which are, however, reversible. Again, a Swedish study reported that, quotes, Death related to diabetes increased for children if food was plentiful during a critical period for the paternal grandfather. But it decreased when excess food was available to the father. These findings suggest that diet can cause changes to genes that are passed down grow generations by the males in a family, and that these alterations can affect susceptibility to certain diseases. The changes, however, were clearly not fixed in the population, since the same factor, well-fed progenitors, cause opposite effects in children and grandchildren respectively no permanent evolution took place. 
What is well established, however, is that epigenetic mutations commonly result in disease. Dr. Danielle Simmons writes, quotes, while epigenetic changes are required for normal development and health, they can also be responsible for some disease states. A disrupt disrupting any of the three systems that contribute to epigenetic alterations can cause abnormal activation or silencing of genes. Such disruptions have been associated with cancer, syndromes involving chromosomal instabilities, and mental retardation. Well, what is the bottom line? While epigenetic effects may alter the way genes are expressed, and can even in principle create new proteins in an organism, their effects are usually reversible and often deleterious. They cannot create new genes and cannot therefore account for macroevolution or common descent. Nor by the same token can they circumvent the waiting time problem that we discussed in the previous chapter. So how about chimps? Not surprisingly, Closely similar genes in humans and chimpanzees are commonly expressed very differently. And this is often the result of alternative splicing in the two species. Reporting the work of Professor Blen Cow at the Banting and Best Department of Medical Research and Molecular Genetics, the online journal Science Daily explains, quotes, it's clear that humans are very different from chimpanzees on several levels. But we wanted to find out if it could be the splicing process that accounts for some of these fundamental differences. The surprising thing we found was that 6 to 8% of the alternative splicing events we looked at were showing differences between the species, which is quite significant. And those genes that show differences in splicing are associated with a range of important processes, including susceptibility to certain diseases. The new findings reveal that alternative splicing process differs significantly between humans and chimpanzees. Close quotes. How did these splicing differences arise? We do not know. Evolution would no doubt argue that random mutations in the non-coding regions of the common ancestor and its descendants became fixed by natural selection. But remember that genetic changes become fixed in populations, not in individuals. And that happens only after hundreds of generations. It is very difficult to see how random mutations could give rise to significant splicing differences between two groups within the same population. Put another way, Darwinian mechanisms would require the splicing differences between chimps and humans to arise only after the two species had already divided into separate populations. Why is that? Because interbreeding within a single population would randomize the effects of alternative splicing and frustrate the emergence of two distinct species. They cannot therefore be responsible for causing a subspecies separation event in the first place. Yet they constitute an important element in the distinction between chimps and humans. Let's go over that again because it is important. 1. 
a mutation in the non-coding regions of one species but not another could arguably change a spliceosome structure and lead to alternative splicing in the first species that doesn't occur in the second. <clears throat> Two. But to fix this mutation in a population takes many generations of that species and cannot happen as long as those possessing the mutation interbreed freely with those who lack it. Fixation requires an isolated breeding stock. Three, so a particular epigenetic control mechanism to arise. Three, so for a particular epigenetic control mechanism to arise in one species and not in a closely related one requires that the two species first form distinct and separate populations. Four, the said control mechanism cannot therefore be the cause of speciation. That is, it cannot cause a single breeding stock to split into two non-interbreeding populations. But what if geographical or similar isolation events triggers speciation? Two populations that are at first genetically identical could become separated geographically or ecologically and then go their separate ways, genetically speaking. Well, yes, that could theoretically happen but it would have to occur over and over again in a serial manner for the hypothetical common ancestor to give rise to all the great ape species. And there is not the slightest reason why a various forest-dwelling apes should not have suffered such isolation from one another. There is not the slightest reason why the various forest-dwelling apes should have suffered such isolation from one another. However, there is an even stronger reason to reject this scenario. It is difficult and perhaps impossible to see how random mutations in one branch of an evolutionary tree eventually produced a highly advanced species man, while all the other branches, starting from the same common ancestor, an ape, only produced other apes, barely distinguishable from the ancestor. If a horse race starts with 20 horses, but only one proceeds to the finish, while 19 contentedly nibble grass around the starting gates, we would suspect a put-up job. Beyond epigenetics, are there other processes beside epigenetic ones that could cause evolution? Some geneticists believe there are. This is not a subject we can explore here but I include this note for the sake of completeness. A growing number of evolutionists believe that the simple neo-Darwinian mechanism of random mutation and natural selection cannot account for the world of living things we know today. They argue that other processes which go beyond epigenetics <coughs> have played a major role in shaping the genomes of modern organisms. And these processes include hybridization, transposition, symbiogenesis, and horizontal gene transfer, and I'll explain briefly in an end note to this chapter.
the interested reader can learn more about them from recent books, such as The Paradigm Shifters and Evolution 2. Even more recently, some geneticists have proposed an omnigenic model in which a phenotypical traits are determined not by one or a handful of genes, but by the coordinated action of hundreds of different genes working in concert. I guess we'll need to watch this space, but one thing is clear. Comparing genomes provides no support for the common belief that man descended from an ape. The chimpanzees in your local zoo are not your closest relatives and you don't need to send them birthday cards. Well, that's the end of that chapter. We obviously will continue with the following chapter in subsequent episodes. Thank you.